This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links <laughs> in the description below. So there's one of my better mess-ups of all time, streaming to the wrong streaming service. <laughs> and some of you who are supporters on both uh, definitely saw that uh, that Twitch was, was there, and I didn't... Uh, I didn't see it until Blackleaf told me. So anyway, let's try again. Good evening, everyone. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. With me in the virtual studio is none other than Blackleaf, your favorite patent attorney. Say hi, Kurt. I'm here as a reality check. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kurt is here to make sure that I notice when I've done things wrong. And Tactical is also here in the virtual studio. Hi, Tac. Hello. So, um, yeah, let's uh, raise one for that. That was fun. Um, hi, everybody. So we're here now on YouTube like we're supposed to be. Thank you to Matthew East for your $10 uh, super chat. Number one fan, says the, uh, the animation there. So anyway, now that I've done an entire intro once already, let's do it again. We are here to talk about this DMCA subpoena to Google slash YouTube. This is not Dark Spilver as far as I know, although there's like a non-zero chance that it could be the same person, but I have my serious doubts that it's the same person. The, the material that was posted seems to be different material. So we'll go over what material is being uh, subpoenaed over, um, and we'll go over what's going on with the law. There are lots of good things that the law allows us to do. We want to adjudicate our disputes in court. We don't want people to adjudicate their disputes outside of court uh, in, in a vigilante justice or, or other violent manner. Um, and having recourse in court allows civilized society to progress. On the other hand, when laws are poorly written or there are unintended consequences, you get stuff like this, where people's identities can be sought. And like the Dark Spilver case, the identity was sought for basically an improper or illegal purpose. The Dark Spilver story, of course, was having posted things on Reddit, like a fundraising flyer and a, and a chart about how the data privacy laws or, or data privacy regulations in Europe are handled by the Watchtower organization. Uh, by posting those things to Reddit, those were very much fair uses. And so the court eventually ruled, Judge James Donato eventually ruled that the uh, subpoena seeking Dark Spilver's identity could not be granted, even though it was initially granted, and even though Judge Sally Kim, the magistrate judge, said that it was proper enough that at least Paul Polidoro, the attorney for Watchtower slash Jehovah's Witnesses, that he could at least see the identity. But then the judge, the, the, the not magistrate judge, the district court judge, for lack of a better phrase, ruled that it was a fair use. We did a video on that, and the way that YouTube does these live streams, when we tell it to do a new live stream based on the settings from an old live stream, it apparently notified everybody that this was a Dark Spilver thing, and then I updated the text and the thumbnail, and then many of you were very surprised that this isn't a Dark Spilver thing. So, this is not about Dark Spilver, as far as I know. This is about a YouTube channel called JW Apostate, and we will get to what's going on in a moment. Let's real quick start with first saying hi to everybody. Um, thank you, Matthew East, for the $10 super chat. And wow, there's a lot of you in, in chat here. So I'm going to try to have a little bit more of a relaxed live stream where I pay more attention to chat than I usually do. Um, sometimes I don't pay attention to chat because I'm just so focused on getting the material done in like a timely fashion that, that I forget to look at chat. So let's take a look first at what law we're talking about. We're not going to spend a million hours on this, but just a few minutes. We are talking about 17 U.S.C. 512, which is the part of the DMCA that governs safe harbors. But it also has the subpoena provision in there and a provision about misrepresenting your rights under copyright. So first, we're going to talk about uh, these major sections 
section A here is about safe harbor and a service provider not being liable if they follow the safe harbor provisions. Uh, section B is for system caching, which is also part of service providers being not liable for uh, uh, any copyright infringement of their users. Um, C is also for service providers and this is the section that allows for a DMCA takedown notice and provides for what it looks like. Elements of a notification, for example. Um, D is for information location tools, directory indexes, references, pointers, hypertext links, etc. Uh, e is for nonprofit educational institutions. And then here's the stuff that we that we really know and have a love hate relationship with. F is for misrepresentations. If anyone knowingly materially misrepresents that material or activity is infringing or that material was removed or disabled from a DMCA takedown by mistake or misidentification, uh, the misrepresenting party shall be liable for damages. Key words, though, knowing materially misrepresents means that it has to you, you have to form a sincere good faith belief before issuing a DMCA uh, takedown or subpoena in this case uh, G is the counter notice procedure about how you can get removed material replaced and move things along towards court and so here's here's how you file a counter notification but that's not what we're here to talk about tonight we're here to talk about subpoenaing the identity of an infringer so when you see them referring to DMCA or rather 17 USC 512 C that's the DMCA takedown DMCA or or, or 512 H is the is a subpoena to identify an infringer and it says that a copyright owner or person authorized to act may issue a subpoena through the clerk of the district court to a service provider specifically for identification of an alleged infringer. So without further ado, let's take a look at what the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society actually filed here. Now I've gone and redacted out the address and phone numbers and everything for Paul D. Polidoro because I don't really want to be guilty of, of any of YouTube misunderstanding that these are public court documents and, and you know, hitting me with some kind of uh, harassment or something strike. So we're being very careful here. That's why that's that's blacked out. The actual court documents don't have any uh, any redactions there. This is a DMCA subpoena to Google. And I'm it's actually for a YouTuber's identity. And those are Google and YouTube are two separate identities. But yeah, Google is a parent organization of YouTube or something or Alphabet is a parent organization of Google. So I'm not too worried about that. I believe they'll, they'll still be successful in in uh, subpoenaing Google, even if they mean YouTube. And of course, this is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. That's the parent organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they ask for a 17 USC 512H subpoena. And thank you to Brent Hess for the $5. There is more comedy in the legal system than I ever suspected before finding your channel. Thanks for what you do. You, you may call it comedy. Sometimes I call it reasons to worry. But that's just my nature. I tend to worry. Um, and... Uh, I also find these things interesting, like uh, basically I would be reading all of this. I mean, I already did, but I would be reading and going over all of this, even if I wasn't doing it in front of a camera and lights and everything. And I'm comfortable in front of the camera and lights, at least to a point. So I really don't mind sharing with you what in the world is going on in the legal world. Plus, I mean, how often do you get to see first-hand documents? Everything that we consume these days is from a TV channel, which is filtered through the lens of the commentators and writers and producers of the TV channels. And we know some of the TV channels, I'm not even going to mention their names, but you know, many of us go over to our parents' house and the TV is just on a, on a news loop, 24 hour news cycle. And it's just running the whole time, whether it's, whether it's one of your, you know, left leaning or right leaning channels, uh, there's really nothing in between. So yeah, that gets, that, that gets, uh, that gets filtered through a lens where, Whereas, although I'm here showing you court documents, and I guess I'm kind of a lens as well, 
Um, and there's going to be just a natural human bias, even though I try to be as centered as possible. Um, I want to show you what's really going on and you can see what's really going on with your own eyes and with your own ears so that you have kind of a base sense of reality. Uh, does that sound like something that, that you're on board with, Blackleaf, or, or why do you do this? No, I, I well, I'm on. I I do it because I love the, I love the subject matter. I love the law, and I love reading it. And I love covering it, and I love learning it. So I cover so much stuff from so many disciplines because I just find it all endlessly fascinating. And of course, there's an endless amount of it. So you know, I never have to worry about exhausting it. But I always feel like I'm learning something more and becoming more educated about many other fields of law. And it's just I love this stuff. And thank you to Rallyus1 for the $5 for what it's worth. YouTube's website is registered under Google. They verified here, here, they verified it through a who is lookup. Great. So uh, let's see what they have to say. Petitioner Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, through its undersigned counsel, hereby requests the clerk, because this has to be issued by the clerk. A subpoena to Google to identify the alleged infringers at issue. So they don't even really have to make up much of a, of a copyright claim. You'll see that as we go through here. There's, there's nothing here saying, here's how we know this is copyright infringement. They just have to say this is copyright infringement. And, you know, we, we are putting ourselves out on the limb that this really is copyright infringement. Zach C, thanks for the $5. To be fair, we get to see primary documents daily on your channel. Yes, that's 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 the whole point is I want to show you what's really going on in my part of the world and, and not um, characterize it for you. Although we do a little bit of characterization, but I want you to have the facts though so that when you hear my characterization, you can agree or disagree and make up your own mind. Think for yourself is a phrase that, that I might say. The proposed DMCA subpoena is attached here too. We'll see that in a moment. The DMCA subpoena is directed to Google, the service provider. So we know that it has to be a service provider under 512H of a YouTube account to which the infringing party is using the name JW apostate. Now, you know what I didn't do? I didn't look up the definition of apostate. So let's do that real quick. Oh, I know this one. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Apostate is someone who used to be religious but then has left the religion. Okay, so we can sort of just by that definition assume that Dark Spilver is not JW Apostate because Dark Spilver was not an apostate. At least, you know, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here. So, JW Apostate uh, is the YouTuber and they posted content at this URL and I brought up the URL and unfortunately I don't have very good news. JW Apostate seems to have gotten wind of what's going on here and the channel has been removed. Now we're going to discuss that in a moment because there is something called the spoliation of evidence which is easy to remember as the spoilation of evidence but it's not called the spoilation or the spoiling of evidence it's called the spoliation which is a a fun word actually let's kind of bring that up too spoliation is the action of ruining or destroying something or taking goods and property we're going to stick we're going to stick with the uh, the the destroying something or ruining something so it's the spoliation of evidence it could be um but let's continue so they posted content and watchtower's request to the clerk is is issued in or, or conducted in good faith a good faith fair use analysis of numerous infringing posts. Why do they say good faith? It's because of that DMCA 512F misrepresentation section. Now saying it does not make it true in this case, but they're trying to kind of prime the pump or let the court and any readers, usually the clerks of court, the court itself, which when I say the court, who do I mean? I mean the judge. And so the judge, who in this case is Kathy C. Bell, you might remember her from the Leibowitz case that I went to and got to see Leibowitz try and back out of, of his 
uh, he had dug himself a hole his i believe grandfather had died i think it was grandfather correct me if i'm wrong guys um and he had lied to the court over a series of of weeks and months um trying not to talk about the circumstances surrounding his grandfather's death it turns out that his grandfather really did die but the timing of things and his handling of it were poor he sort of made giant assumptions that the court would just let him off the hook and that was judge kathy c bell who's going to be overseeing this subpoena the following URLs represent a sample of the infringing conduct or content posted on the YouTube account. And I also looked these things up. And unfortunately, because the channel's been taken down, these are all different links. One, two, three, four, five. And no, they're all the same video unavailable. So that that really doesn't help anybody. Uh, thank you to Shilas Darklay, $10. Thank you for the content. Keep up the good work. Really appreciate your support. It helps us keep going here, and um, pr pretty soon in, in this in the summer or the coming months, we're going to be going to be moving out of this studio, and probably you know fingers crossed, coronavirus and all that, probably moving over to Luxembourg with Kaylee. We're getting married this summer, so your financial support really helps right about now. So this content infringes copyrights held by Watchtower. Boom! They just say it. They just say it. He supports it with a declaration. We'll go over that in a moment. But that's it. It just says it. It doesn't prove it. It's not It's not been adjudicated. A court has not found it to be true. But they get the subpoena anyway. So let's, let's, see, let's see what they have to say. They have satisfied the requirements of 512H in that they have submitted copies of notifications sent pursuant to 512C, what is, what is that? 512C is the DMCA takedown provision. So they've submitted a takedown. They have submitted a proposed subpoena. They have submitted a sworn declaration confirming the purpose of the DMCA subpoena being to identify alleged infringers or inf infringer or infringers. And they have pledged that such information will only be used for the purposes of protecting Watchtower's rights. How, how, how binding is that last one is the question I immediately want I, I would love for to. that to be binding, but I see that in many copyright cases where they have used the DMCA, um, or even sometimes where they haven't used the DMCA, that the subpoena will only be used for the purposes of protecting their rights. Uh, and, and these rights in particular are the copyrights. So this can only be used for copyright enforcement and not be used for anything else. But of course, that's the suspicion, right? If it turns out that JW Apostate is still in the Jehovah's Witness organization, the concern is that that will affect their membership in that organization. And since the Jehovah's Witnesses don't seem to be very tolerant of dissenters in their, um, in their midst. Um, they usually, my understanding is that they disfellowship, shun, and exile the person, and even their own family cuts them off if their family is still in the organization. So for people that might not know, because I've, I actually just started listening to a bunch of things um, you might not know with Tom Scott. <laughs> Um, some stuff with XGW people um, that they have different acronyms. So one of them is uh, PIMO so, or yeah, so physically in, mentally out. And what it means is like you could still be attending services, you could still um, publicly be identifying as a Jehovah's Witness, but mentally you've left. But you know, there are so many consequences for leaving in terms of being ostracized from your family um, and being shunned and losing all of those so social supports that they have chosen to keep up appearances. And so what I worry about is that if JW Apostate um, is physically in and mentally out, that even though they they're calling themselves an apostate in their actual day-to-day -day life they could be um they they could 
still be identifying as Jehovah's Witness so that they don't suffer the consequences. And Zach C. asks, why can't they just file suit against a John Doe user known as JW Apostate rather than having to fish for the identity right off the bat? They can. They can file a John Doe suit and make claims of copyright infringement. This is easier. Um, I, 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 mis I misspoke the other day, I believe. I said that a subpoena like this is in, it requires an action to be initiated, and so it's $400. I believe I was corrected. Um, I did not look it up, so I'm guessing here, but uh, assuming that I was correctly corrected, it seems to be only $75 to get the DMCA subpoena. So then you don't need to file a lawsuit and be prepared to prosecute an action and defend your positions and claims. Instead, you just have to be prepared to defend your request for a subpoena. So it's it's remarkably easier for Watchtower or for any DMCA 512H subpoena claimant to obtain that subpoena than it is to be prepared to fully prosecute an action. So they finish up by saying that they have complied with the statutory requirements and request that the clerk issue the subpoena. Now, this is different from normal subpoenas. When you're in the middle of a lawsuit, when you're in the discovery section of a lawsuit after your Rule 16 conference and your Rule 26 disclosures, um, then that starts the discovery section and you can discover all relevant evidence from your opponent in a civil case. So if if this was a full lawsuit and we had entered discovery and JW Apostate had been served and they had had their initial scheduling conference and they had made their initial disclosures, which are all requirements under the law, then you can issue subpoenas all you want. I, uh, you can just start writing them. You can just start filling out subpoenas and sending them to everybody who's got relevant evidence and they have to turn it over and, and the relevant the, the the people who who are involved in the lawsuit can be deposed they can sit they have to sit for seven hours of interview under oath on the record in front of a transcriptionist or court reporter they have to respond to requests for admission which are yes or no questions that or rather questions that answer or that require an answer of yes or no they can be subject to interrogatories which are questions which require a fully written out answer and they can have to produce evidence, even if that evidence is against themselves. The civil standard does not allow for uh, no consequences for not testifying, even if it's against yourself, or not producing evidence, even if it's against yourself. You can take the Fifth Amendment where there is a potential for criminal prosecution, but in a civil action, the court can still use that against you. That's called an adverse inference. Uh, yes, Michael Berthelson, you do have to register the copyrights with the Copyright Office, so that's something that will come into this. Um, and, and we'll see what happens. Uh, here's the thing, though. The Fourth Estate case, Fourth Estate Public Benefit Corporation v. Wall-Street.com, I don't believe it said that the, that the um, copyright has to be registered before a subpoena, but that's something that would definitely be challenged. If I was receiving a subpoena, that's one of the things I would put into either an answer or motion would be, hey, if these copyrights aren't registered, then you shouldn't be able to sue under that, that standard. So let's go on to the uh, declaration. This is the declaration of Paul D. Polidoro, Council of Record for Watchtower. What is a declaration? Well, have you ever had to go to a notary public and sign something under oath or at least sign something in front of the notary? Uh, like if you have to get your car registration transferred, your car registration transferred to another owner, like somebody bought your car or something, you have to go to a place that does that, usually called a notary public. And even though the car registration thing itself isn't a 
you know, notarizing of something. Um, they usually do all those public records things. Well, a notary is an official public witness. And under most states laws, you have to have certain documents witnessed by a notary and you can't sign the thing until you're in front of the notary and they charge you in Pennsylvania, it's like five or $6. Well, there is a, an, an analog or parallel in federal law called a declaration under penalty of perjury. And under that law, which I forget the section, we could look it up, we'll look it up real quick. Um, you don't have to do it in front of a notary, but you do have to state that you understand you're making the statement under penalty of perjury. And so this is one of those. Paul D. Polidoro is making this statement under penalty of perjury. Uh, Professor Chaos asks and gives $2, could the channel be down f because of DMCA strikes? It could be, but we know otherwise, and I'll show you that in a moment. So this says that Paul DePolidoro is authorized to act on behalf of Watchtower, submits this declaration uh, for the subpoena to identify the user identified as JW Apostate and gives a link to their channel that they have issued some kind of DMCA takedown. And so there could be, it, it, could, it could be that the channel went down because of the DMCA takedowns, but I think we know otherwise. We'll see. Uh, they submitted notifications to Google, identifying the infringing content posted by the user and provided the information required in 512C. And those true, or, true and correct copies are attached as uh, Exhibit 1 over here, which we'll see in a moment. And that the purpose uh, for this DMCA subpoena is to obtain the identify, identify, attain the identity, the identity of the alleged infringer, and will only be used for copyright purposes, which of course we all doubt that, right? We all, we all doubt that it's going to be um, used for copyright purposes exclusively. And then here's the part. I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of New York and the United States that the foregoing is true or correct. True and correct. John Powers, thank you for the five dollars. Lawyers that can't laugh at themselves turn into Republicans. <laughs> uh, I am. Um, I. 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 I uh, I'm not going to get too far into politics here, but I do know, uh, 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 to quote Trump, there are good people on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure uh, that's better or worse, but thanks. I'm not sure if that's better or worse, but that's my snarky response. Um, and then they, then they, this is a, this is what they do. They have to provide a proposed subpoena. So this is an unsigned uh, subpoena here. You can see that there's nothing signed, but it says this matter comes before the court upon the ex parte application. That means there's no opposing party. Um, there's no party at all. Not that the other party consents. That's a different thing. That would be a consent subpoena or a consent uh, motion. But rather, this is an ex parte applicant of Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. And they have provided supporting documents and they want Google to produce the identity and then ordered that the clerk shall issue the subpoena. Valis, thank you for the five dollars. How much time is allowed to fight such a subpoena before the request is fulfilled and how much information can be gained just by searching? Well, this is where it gets a little soft. The DMCA does not provide for the time required to respond to the subpoena. Instead, the subpoenaing party is supposed to accommodate a reasonable amount of time, which is usually 14 to 40 excuse me, 14 to 45 days, and aggressive, uh, aggressive parties will prefer shorter periods of time. But because this is a subpoena to the service provider, usually the service provider will turn around and say that there is some kind of law or rule or act, one of which is the Cable TV Privacy Act of 1984, that when a identity is sought, of a user of a service provider, the service provider needs additional time to serve notice of that subpoena, listen to these words carefully, notice of the subpoena on the, I, the party whose identity is being sought. 
and that notice has to grant a reasonable and meaningful opportunity to respond to that subpoena request before the identity is released to the subpoenaing party. Now, I said, listen carefully, notice and a meaningful opportunity to respond sounds like something very, very important in American law, in U.S. law, and in the principle of all law in general. So you'll find this notice and meaningful opportunity to respond language and and uh, operation in just about every modern law system in the world that accommodates for basic human rights. I don't mean that some uh, country that has a dictatorship or something abides by this, but I mean that, that when you have a modern democratic system of laws, especially the English law and American law and French law, um, you will have something called due process. So that, that means that you are due a meaningful process of law and even U.S. law has read even further into this that you have certain rights under that, not just notice and a meaningful, and, and whatever that means, no, that you also have the rights that are underlying that. So the notice has to be a proper notice. It has to be an effective notice. So not just, oh, well, somebody called you and told you, but actually it has to follow a particular process and it has to be meaningful and you have to have a meaningful opportunity to respond, not just in in words only, oh, well, we sent it to you and you could have come to the courthouse 15 minutes later and responded. No, it has to be a reasonable amount of time for you to figure out what your response is and get something into the court. The court has to actually read what you read, what you wrote and try to interpret it properly, especially if you're a pro se party, and you have to have a meaningful court adjudication of your claims or defenses. That's due process. That is a core of American jurisprudence. Um, anything else you want to add, Blackleaf, about uh, about due process? Uh, no, I think I think you pretty much got it. You know, we just want to give everyone an opportunity to be heard and to challenge this. We saw this in the Dark Spilver case, where the subpoena was served, and then there was a challenge on it on behalf of Dark Spilver. Google, of course, gets subpoenas for its materials all the time has entire departments to deal with these kind of things. And a database, so, the Lumen database, I believe is what they call it, is available online yeah. and they publish when they receive those kinds of notices. So, you know, I, I feel like they're going to follow all these things. The, the only thing that's sort of har harming my end of the discussion is it's really hard to make the fair use analysis or the infringement analysis on the underlying merits of the claim without being able to see the materials that we're talking about. So well, is it wholesale copying or something else? I don't know. And that's yeah. what we're that's what's coming up next here is exhibit one. This is really all that we have aside from a couple articles. So then we're going to go over so exhibit, exhibit one left a lot to be desired. Uh, yes, it did. But that's what we're going to go over. That's, that's what we got. And then there's a couple articles that we're going to go over as well. Tech, uh, not tech dirt, uh, torrent freak wrote an article, reclaim the net wrote an article and, uh, while I, I don't know that I'm going to show the articles in their entirety, I am going to go over the key parts of them that I think are relevant here. So this is exhibit one, and this is identifying the allegedly infringing material. And so this is from Inbox LGLIPG, which was the part of the, uh, uh, it's not the email address, but it's, it's the name of the email address from uh, the Jehovah's Witness organization, and it's to copyright at youtube.com. And this is February 27th. This is actually more than a week ago. And it says, Dear Sir, Madam, I represent Watchtower. It has come to our attention that you are reproducing and distributing Watchtower's intellectual property illegally and without authorization. Below is the information you need to identify the unauthorized display of their intellectual property. There's the JW apostate channel name. And then they say that they're going to have the title over here, the infringing URL, and whether there is a non-infringing URL available. Uh, spoiler alert, there's no uh, non-infringing URLs available because apparently they're not published. So somehow the JW apostate channel got a hold of these videos. 
Congregation Accounting Training Video Number 1 and 2, a video called How You Can Support the LDC. Uh, is that... I thought it was Latter-day Saints, but this is LDC. What does that stand for? Latter-day Christians? Latter-day Christ? I don't know. Um, anybody who knows, shout it out. Whose leadership can you trust and choose your apps wisely? And other, other than that, I really don't know what the content is, but I am, I am concerned that these are not fair uses, at least not on initial examination, because they seem to be copies of, uh, of uh, whole, wholesale copies or, or outright copies or per se copies of videos from the Jehovah's Witness organization. And I'm not sure how they got, how JW Apostate got a hold of them. Latter day church. Okay. <laughs> Trutch. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. We hereby request that you take all steps necessary to remove the infringing content. Advise us within 10 days uh, whether or not you'll take the action requested. I have a good faith belief that the materials complained of are not authorized by copyright, and I state under penalty of perjury, as we showed before. So that is the entirety of what you need to file in order to subpoena someone's identity. So you could imagine this being abused by a party who might not have a full, clear copyright claim, but might want to uncover the identity of someone that they claim was infringing. So let's take a look here then. There are a couple articles. Um, here on Reclaim the Net is a article called Jehovah's Witness Group Attempts to Use DMCA to Unmask YouTuber. And they note that there are 60 subpoenas since mid-2017. And we have a list. We're going to take a look at the list of subpoenas. And I'm just going to parse through this a little bit. Um, they, they refer to the Torrent Freak article that we'll look at next. But they don't seem to know what exactly was on the channel. But they do say that a day before the order was signed, Torrent Freak reached out to JW Apostate for comment on Reddit, and very shortly thereafter, the Reddit account, its channel, and all of its videos were deleted, leaving nothing in their wake. Now, doesn't YouTube, when YouTube receives a DMCA takedown, don't you see it? Doesn't, doesn't YouTube post something on the video? This video was removed by a content claim from such and such, right? Uh, let me do a quick search and see what one looks like. You know, at the risk of defending the, 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 the church here on this one, and I have a feeling this is not going to be the first time I'm going to do this tonight, but 60 since 2017 doesn't strike me as an awful lot. You know, they, they have a lot of different members and a lot of different people are interested in it. So if you're talking about 60 in the sc scope of three years, it doesn't sound like unduly excessive. Well, yeah, I guess it, it depends on, on how much content is being reproduced and why. So, yes, if the videos had been removed, so here's what it looks like. This channel does not exist, but rather it would look something like this if the content had been removed by a DMCA takedown, as opposed to this video has been removed by the user. So I think I'm safe to say that that JW Apostate take, took down their own channel and their own content after receiving the DMCA subpoena notice, or at least should I say that someone from Torrent Freak notified them of the DMCA uh, subpoena. So then Torrent Freak writes in their article, Jehovah's Witness body uses DMCA to subpoena YouTube for apostate identity. And they say basically the same thing, that there was a JW Apostate YouTube channel with 1,720 subscribers and 42 videos. This YouTube channel is used for leaking Watchtower videos to view Watchtower leaked documents. Visit our Reddit. At least initially, the channel had many videos, uh, but they got the DMCA subpoena. Um, I'm not sure how, where they got this image from, but this is apparently some of the 
the content midweek meeting from this year uh, february of this year that all the midweek meetings um whose leadership can you trust choose your apps wisely etc so the district court judge of course is kathy c bell which i'm told oversees many if not all of these 59 subpoenas why do i say 59 when i just said 60 well we know that one of them was filed in the northern district of california before judge sally kim and james donato and that's the dark spilver one and dark spilver one w-o-o-n so thanks to the eff getting involved there but there are 59 other subpoenas out there over the last few years and so there's another website this is avoidjw.org Ad advancing veracity openness integrity and due process for jehovah's witnesses and so they have a list here of the 60 subpoenas and only one of them has a motion to quash number 10 here except for the dark spilver case which has a motion to quash that's number 31 and then the rest of these are all seemingly unopposed scribed archive.org youtube youtube facebook streamable biblia and sema there's a lot of of channels here or or providers here or creators here who apparently have been subpoenaed and they say one thing down here that i need to correct the law is specific to service providers which means it can't be used against someone who's not a provider that's technically true but remember the subpoena is going to the provider for an individual's identity that doesn't mean that just because it's going to the service provider means it can't be used against an individual it just means that you can't subpoena the identity from an individual you have to subpoena it from the service provider so it's not a law with no teeth unfortunately it is a law with teeth and that makes it particularly terrible because you see what happens here they've got 60 subpoenas out and only two of them were opposed uh i, I don't see the outcome of the previous one um which doesn't seem to have a it doesn't seem to go anywhere it's a dead link thank you aikita hakubi for the five dollars really appreciate that um i had a I, I question do, uh, go ahead sure okay so it looks like some of these videos are being leaked um so the what goes through my head is is there an exception for things that are newsworthy like I'm, th I'm thinking in terms of of copyright. It's like yeah. yes, they're releasing the um, these private videos. I'll say, but it's meant in order to um, educate or expose, like educate people and expose something that's behind closed doors. So how would that affect the copyright analysis? Yeah. So so that's you're hitting the nail right on the head and it's what i wanted to talk about next is so what's what's going on here um on one hand i fully agree with organizations being able to control who excuse me reposts their material and this is mostly what where i agree with it is mostly for creative content that is meant to be sold or meant to be controlled by its creator as you know in, in a way that we all know and love and and consume every day uh, music on various various music media cds and and um, um mp3s and aacs and and you know google play and apple music and all that um movies are definitely something that i'm fully on board with protecting uh sheet music for those creators books for those creators my youtube videos are all things that i would expect i can control the copyright and copying and distribution and display and performance of and if you just go and copy a lawful masses video and post it on your youtube channel hoping to start your own channel off get a little jump start or something uh, i might be inclined to either claim the video or or issue a dmca takedown but 
This isn't the same thing now, is it? These aren't the creative works of the Jehovah's Witness organization, as best as I can tell. These are videos of their meetings that are meant to be distributed to people who want to review the meetings or, or otherwise didn't make the meeting or something like that. I don't want to speak for them, but uh, they, they seem to be you know, videos of meetings, as, as shown here in the Torrent Freak uh, article. You know, midweek meeting 21720, midweek meeting 21520. So I doubt that these are the kind of works that are at the core of copyright. Instead, they technically do have a copyright, and I'm not really disputing that they have a copyright, but they aren't as creative works. They're more factual works. They're more just recordings of events that happened. Now, there are some things in here that could be creative works. I don't know what Choose Your Apps Wisely is. That could be a creative work. Uh, whose leadership can you trust? These could be these could be highly edited, produced works with cameras, angles, and things, and, and definitely uh, uh, hit the core of copyright protection. And they're just using that to further their message, which they are allowed to further their religious message. That's protected under the First Amendment as well, and copyright doesn't seem to have a problem and I don't have a problem with the, them having copyright protection on their creative works. But Can I offer the, a challenge? Go ahead. I, I think uh, I'm interested how that analysis might apply to what you and I are doing on our own respective channels, because in the same way that they are filming meetings of events that are happening, you say those are factual. Okay, well, you know, we are at this exact moment filming and recording a meeting that is happening between you and me and we could, you know, amongst ourselves, decide what distribution policy we want. We've chosen sure. to distribute that the way we have. But, you know, I, I think what's good for one is good for all. So I, I, I'm interested in the degree to which you think they would have a weaker copyright interest than, for example, you or I in this stream. Um, so the only the only the only major difference I see here is we are adding a bit of creativity in how we present things and there is a camera angle and the purpose of the of the of the stream is to reach this audience whereas the Jehovah's Witness organization as as we just saw in exhibit 1 they don't publish these things they aren't meant for publication to the general public or for review by the general public they are more or less private videos that are meant for distribution to their own uh, prefer you know their own list of of internal people yeah, so, and, and if and if we if we as an organization either now or in the future decide as part of a Patreon benefit or something sure. like that, you know, we have some sort of tier level where we're going to have restricted videos to only certain people. That would be our prerogative. So now, it feels a little special pleading. It feels a little bit like you know they're using their creativity in the in a religious sense for religious analysis and religious discussion. We're using our creativity for legal analysis, legal yeah. discussion. You know, they're choosing a restrictive policy. We could choose a restrictive policy. So it feels like a little special pleading to say we're in a different tier than them to me. Uh, so, no, you, you, you make a very good point that if I'm going to ding them one for not being the most creative thing out there, yeah, I also have to point the, you know, the three fingers back at myself, um, look in the mirror as, as it goes, because we are also not creating a movie or not creating a book of, of fiction. I've not created an entire universe with characters and plots and descriptions and themes and things uh, like we saw in the Star Trek uh, Tardigrades thing. Like there were lots of details there that had all been well thought out by a creator. Here, my well thought out creation is pointing a camera at myself and organizing a series of publicly available court documents and then trying to make a show out of it. Uh, Hamable of Carthage, I need to sub to JW Apostate then. It might be too late as they've taken <laughs> their channel down. Uh, I laugh, but I don't mean that that's a good thing. Obviously, they are responding to receiving the subpoena now receiving the subpoena and, and also, isn't going sorry, and taking down the channel for, isn't going to change anything but go ahead blackleaf i was just saying you know for for better or worse i try to be very lawfully neutral in my analysis of these things so i don't try to consider things like 
if the person behind this is good or bad. I don't try to consider things like if we like them or not, because that would jade our analysis and cause us to draw the wrong legal conclusion, which is not a good thing. So, like, is JW as an organization good or bad? Is their desire to have the fellowship rules they have good or bad? I don't, you know, I'm don't yeah, really. I'm not really commenting on that too much. They, 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 as far as, as far as I'm concerned, I should have freedom of association. They should have freedom of association. So I think, like, you know, we should have the same rules that bind everybody. So, you know, I, I don't think this disfavoring uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or what they do or their own decision or internal policies really, at least to my mind, should guide the legal analysis. So for me, the legal analysis seems to favor JW. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I think they're a good group. I just think that they're deserving of the same rights as everyone, equal justice before law and all that. Uh, so. Pro one theologist, I do see your question, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, nope, nope gives $5 and says, can you fight a subpoena with a fair use argument via the Sargon precedent? Yes. So what we're going to do now is go through a quick fair use analysis and see, you know, so we're making some giant assumptions here. Um, I'm assuming that this JW apostate channel pretty much just reproduced wholesale per se exact copies of existing Jehovah's Witness videos and did not add any other content like a voiceover commentary or even text commentary. The titles here aren't even different. So thinking back to Sargon and thinking back to H3H3, there was in H3H3, there was commentary. They would cut to a video for a cop, a, you know, a, a scene or, or part of a video from Matt Haas, and then they would cut back to Ethan and Gila, and they would make commentary on what they had just seen, and then do that back and forth for a few minutes, and then that was the end of the video. Uh, in Sargon's case, Sargon creatively edited, um, even though it wasn't you know, a brand new video. It was just edited to show uh, Akila Hughes' excitement about the election of, of the president in 2016, and she supported Hillary Clinton, and she was very excited because everybody expected she would win, and she literally titled her video, We Thought She Would Win. And then the, you know, crushing defeat and, and, and emotions of having all of that build up and then being sort of uh, unexpectedly uh, defeated. After that, Sargon's video simply shortened her video, edited it down to make his his commentary or criticism point, and then he titled it something different, SJW Levels of Awareness. And so what I'm not seeing here is creative titles or creative editing to repurpose the material. Instead, I just see a reposting of the material literally saying we want to leak these videos to the public. So like a WikiLeaks kind of thing. So I'm not sure this is actually going to be a fair use under the Sargon or H3H3 or, or just general fair use standard. Just for reminder, the fair use standard is a four-part balancing test. No one of the four parts automatically disposes of the other three. So it's not like an or test or a disjunctive test where you, you know, if you meet any one of the four, you're good. It has to be a balanced test. So you can, you can have a strong showing on one of the elements and a weak showing on others and lose, or you could have a strong showing on one or more of the elements and a weak showing on the others and still win. And that was Sargon's uh, win, was basically he reproduced the content, which is generally in violation of the, uh, the third factor, which requires you to use the minimal amount that you need and not to just per se copy it outright. Um, but the judge said that he did transform under the first factor, which is the purpose and character of the use. The use is the secondary use, the Sargon use or the H3H3 use, not the Akilah Hughes use, which is the original work, or the Matt Haas use, which is the original work. So 
under the first factor, the purpose and character of the use, what is the transformation that exists here on the JW apostate channel? The best that we could say is, like Tactical said before, that it could be considered news reporting, but then I'm not seeing anything here to suggest that these leaks were actually couched as news reporting, that there was some kind of introduction saying, this week we had the midweek meeting and this is what happened at the midweek meeting and it shows just cuts to the to some parts of the midweek meeting and then says, you should know all about these things and, you know, you're, we're JW Apostate, we're your number one source for, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witness news or something. I don't think that that necessarily clears fair use, but it would at least be arguable as a transformative purpose, a change in the purpose from the original to the use, to the secondary use, and that news reporting is one of the protected fair use factors, just a factor, a balancing test. The Commentary is minimum, though, in that. So what kind of commentary is there? Where is the criticism? Well, the Sargon case does say that the criticism could be in the comments by the viewers who are now critical, like you are, like many of you are in the comments here, in the in the chat here. Um, the commentary could be argued to be the comments on YouTube. Now, I don't know if this channel had comments turned on or not. I'm assuming they did. They kind of are by default. But uh, so that would be at least arguable. The second factor is comparing the nature of the two works. So posting things on JW Apostate as leaks is definitely a different use than the original use, which is to distribute these videos to the internal uh, list of people who are approved by the Jehovah's Witness organization. Um, but I'm not sure that they've really done too much to change anything with the second fair use factor, it's really just comparing the nature of the works. The original work is not commercial in nature, it's internal. It's an internal video being distributed to the approved list, whereas the new work is arguably commercial, or at least on the fringes of commercial. JW Apostate does not seem to be a non-profit or educational or both institution and rather is trying to uh, inform the world about things going on inside the private life of the Jehovah's Witness organization. So I'm not sure that, that they win on the second fair use factor. The third fair use factor is to use only the minimum amount of material required to make your fair use purpose, your criticism or commentary point. And I don't see how a wholesale reproduction literally called a leak, how that actually makes or overcomes the third fair use factor. I would think that a judge would find in favor of Jehovah's Witness on the third fair use factor. And then the fourth fair use factor is the usurpation of the market. This is easily, easily understood when you think of a movie or music being reproduced. Um, if I'm selling a DVD or Blu-ray of the latest movie that's not even out on DVD or Blu-ray yet, I am usurping the market. And, and even less than that, I'm still usurping the market even if the DVD or Blu-ray is out. I don't have the right to just wholesale reproduce a movie like from Hollywood, you know, you know, if I'm watching Picard on Amazon in Luxembourg because it's on Amazon Prime in Luxembourg, but here it's on CBS All Access, and I don't feel like like I don't feel like um, uh, paying for it. So if I figure out how to get Picard from Luxembourg over here to the U.S. so that we can either I can just watch it or we can all watch it, uh, now I'm usurping the market because I'm supposed to be paying for it through whatever service the copyright owner wants it distributed dis distributed distributed through. So, what's the market here, though? The markets are in this case. The original work is not even marketed. It's a private publication to the approved list of people within the Jehovah's Witness organization. And the market in the JW Apostate channel would be the general public. 
So I, I don't really see how we're not usurping the market, but it's also a really weak us usurpation of the market. There is no market. The market is the internal people, and the external market is people who want to know how the Jehovah's Witness organization works internally and see if there's any absurdity or anything to, you know, have a reaction to, or maybe just for informational purposes. So this is a really weak fair use argument, I think. I, I don't think that the JW Apostate channel is really on the right side of the fair use uh, line. What, what do I mean by that? So I'm a copyright attorney and I have a fiduciary duty to my clients. That means I have to act in the best interests of my clients, even if it's not in my own best interest. If you go to a financial advisor as opposed to an accountant or lawyer, a financial advisor doesn't have a fiduciary duty. They can advise you to buy certain products that benefit them, even if they're not in your best interest. Whereas an attorney has to act in your best interest, give you legal advice. We saw a great example of this where an attorney had messed up a case, had failed to file something on time and lost a case and said to the client, we're very sorry that we messed up, but we now need to inform you that your case is no longer against the plaintiff or defendant, but your case is now against us who screwed up your case. And so even though that seems counter to what any person would do, you know, tell somebody, by the way, you got to sue us now. Um, that's actually the proper response is, hey, I screwed up your case. I still have to act in your best interests. Now we have to terminate our representation because we are adverse parties and you have to make a claim against us if you want to pursue your claim. And that's a terrible situation for an attorney to be in. And I'm glad that that attorney had malpractice insurance to cover for that. But... Uh, that's an example of the fiduciary duty. Um, as a person with a fiduciary duty in the completely hypothetical situation, I am not offering my services here, but in the completely hypothetical situation that JW that I was representing someone in, in JW Apostate's position, I, I would want them to make better uses, make, make more clear fair uses of the JW videos, the Jehovah's Witness videos. So if you look at this brief list here, choose your apps wisely, whose leadership can you trust and midweek meeting videos, what I would want them to do is not just wholesale per se publish the private videos of the Jehovah's Witness organization, but I'd want them to edit them to show only what they need to show to make voiceover or face on camera commentary to criticize them where necessary to point out the newsworthiness where necessary to mock where necessary because those are the fair uses that are allowed and i would have a much easier time defending that and e even then there's still some areas where it's questionable they're publishing private videos that are not meant for publication so it's uh it's another factor that comes into it and i'm not exactly sure where that comes into a fair use analysis it's probably factor two uh, the nature of the two works so an unpublished video versus a published video I think the court is going to favor the unpublished video because it wasn't meant to be published to the general public and it was meant to be kept internal only. But still, at least it's much stronger of an argument to have made commentary, criticism, news reporting, especially for educational purposes, and even stronger if you're a nonprofit organization doing it for educational purposes. So. I would also think it would fall into the usurpation of the market because if your market is non-existent by your own choice, the other person putting into a market that you never wanted to exist, yeah, I think can go into the usurpation analysis. If there's no criticism or commentary, then definitely you fail on the fourth fair use factor because you've usurped the market. If there's criticism or commentary, the courts usually say that that doesn't actually usurp the market. Uh, if if someone if someone write if someone makes let's just take cats for example so there was recently the mainstream hollywood production or remake of the famous longest running broad uh, broadway musical cats i've even seen it in person i've gone to broadway and seen cats well before the ticket prices have skyrocketed 
um, the movie didn't do so well. If I made a video criticizing and making commentary about Cats and I showed some footage from the actual Cats movie to show you how terrible it was, and if my video goes viral and gets a billion views and nobody sees Cats the movie and everybody who gets asked about it says, oh yeah, I saw Leonard French's video and it drove me to not see the video. I was gonna see the movie, but I didn't see the movie because I saw Leonard French's criticism of it. That's perfectly okay. That is not market usurpation. And that is a perfectly okay thing to have happen. A critical video, a critical transformative fair use video can uh, diminish the market without being uh, without running afoul of the fourth fair use factor. Now, I do want to answer pro one theologist question. Um, let me scroll up here and find it because there's lots of comments. I love that there's lots of comments here. Um, but they say that they conduct. Where is it? Maybe I'll just do a quick search for your name because there's a lot of comments here. But they say that they conduct um, audits. And I'm not quite sure what that means. A theological audit in this case, I believe, would be them analyzing um, the the talk or whatever from a theological perspective and saying, you know, maybe where certain ideas come from or, or what that would be called. So it sounds maybe um, educational or analytical in nature. Yeah, uh, a pro one theologist, if you could repost your question, because I think chat has scrolled up so far that I that I actually can't see it anymore. Like I've I've I'm scrolled all the way up to the top, and I, I just I just think YouTube doesn't reproduce comments after a period of time. Um, but yeah, so that's more or less the way that I would recommend that you don't run afoul of the law is to make sure that you're may, you 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 really ding you really check all the boxes with your fair use criticism commentary for a transformative purpose using the minimum amount of material that you need to make your point and that you're not directly usurping the market except by criticism. Um, so, yeah, Pro One Theologist uses J.W. Apostate's videos for theological analysis. Uh, yeah, so if you're doing an analysis of the theology contained in one of these weekly meetings or Choose Your Apps Wisely or Whose Leadership Can You Trust videos, um, you want to use the minimum amount necessary to make your point. So, in other words, don't run the whole video from beginning to end and only comment on parts of it. it the parts that you comment on are the parts that you use. You cut out the rest. Um, that makes it a much easier time to defend the fair use. The other thing is, prepare yourself. You can still get sued. You just get to defend yourself and, and get to prove that your fair use analysis was correct and then likely get your attorney's fees and costs back. But many people understandably so, are afraid of going to court or are, uh, I like to use the word fortitude, they don't have the stomach or fortitude to go to court. Believe it or not, I'm one of those people. When I had the dog thing, when I had the warden charge me with an agricultural offense that felt an awful lot like a criminal offense last year, uh, because my dog had bit another dog, they had, they had, they had gotten into it and my dog was the bigger dog, so uh, my dog was the one that got charged. Um, it was. It felt very much like a criminal charge, and uh, it was. It was not fun. It really undid me for a little while. Uh, I was worried about my my dog. She is. She is my pride and joy. She is. She's my lover. She's. She's a great dog. Um, she's very well behaved, and and I was just beside myself emotionally speaking, that that this could happen. And it happened outside of my watch too. Like I wasn't, I wasn't the one taking care of her, so I felt very helpless. And I don't like feeling helpless. So I was very eager to attack that court case with everything that I had and get it over with as quickly as possible. And even the one and a half months or two months that it drug out really, really affected me. And and I had a really hard time with that two months of my life. And I was at the time getting ready to get engaged to Kaylee and go back to Luxembourg, and and it really put a 
a damper on all of the positive things that were happening at the time. And to this day, I still worry about that dog and anything ever happening again. And I give my parents very strict instructions, not because my parents won't, won't we did anything wrong or anything at all, uh, but rather just that I'm worried about the dog. I don't want her off the leash. I don't want her outside the fence. I don't want her to even go to the dog park anymore, lest she have a fight with another dog. And then the warden gets to point to a second incident. So unfortunately, like my dog is a house dog now, and we don't, we, we go for walks and stuff, but we don't, uh, we don't really do the socialization that that dog is supposed to have because heaven forbid she ever got into it with another dog. Even if there was an explanation, I've already got an incident on record and the warden could point to that. So uh, yeah, I get real worried about that. So you could imagine that the, the person receiving a DMCA subpoena or the person receiving a copyright infringement lawsuit is undone a bit by that claim, even if they're in the right, unless they are a person of, 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 of good means, money, um, wealth, that they can pay for an attorney and not have to worry about the outcome of a case, most of us would get, would be worried about it. I would be worried about a case against me, even if I could pay for it, I'm still going to be worried about it and it's going to affect me. So that's a reality of today's legal system that it affects people emotionally, it affects people's ability to sleep at night, to perform at their jobs, it affects me being creative when I am overwhelmed emotionally speaking, I don't do well with uh, with making my videos and making them creative. And some of you have even caught it. Some of you have literally asked me, hey, you seem really overwhelmed right now, and uh, you know, are you doing okay, buddy? And, and yeah, that, that I, I, I appreciate that some of you can see enough of me through this lens and through this camera and, and over the internet that we actually made a connection and you noticed that my emotions were down one day or that I was uh, suffering in some way. And I look forward to the days when I don't have any of that stuff and I can focus on one thing, this channel, and creating educational videos for you. And when I do get those chances to be in the here and the now and focus on what's important and not be distracted by what's not, or, or at least what's not on the table right here and now, uh, I find myself being more creative in the videos. Uh, look at the Marsh v. Alabama case, the public forum v. private forum case that we just put out a few days ago. I was able to put a little bit more time into that video and put some, some graphics that slid in and I wanted to show you what Chickasaw looked like so I made some creative edits there. And I wasn't able to do the entire video of creative edits. I was only able to put in a couple hours of time. So what I can see myself getting there and it's really exciting and it's really fun. And you can imagine how quickly that would be derailed by me getting sued for something like posting JW videos online. So yeah, to protect yourself, you want to post only fair uses of other videos. And if you don't know, then contact an attorney. Um, we get a lot of questions. And one of the things I want to do with Lawful Masses when it goes to become a, a nonprofit educational organization is I want to have a method for everybody to get their questions answered in at least some basic sense, even if it can't be legal advice. Uh, it, it should at least be some kind of guidance. So, yeah. Um, so that's really all I have. There are 60 subpoenas that have been filed by the Watchtower organization over the past three years. And this is the 60th. And so this is um, concerning, excuse me, concerning, but also not the end of the world. This is not, this does not seem to be a dark spilver situation. This seems to be a, uh, a, a legitimate copyright claim. It doesn't mean we have to like it. I'm not saying that I like that it's a, a legitimate copyright claim, but it does appear to be a situation where JW Apostate wholesale posted their videos without criticism and commentary, and it would be a little bit different uh, of, of, of a defense. And I don't see that this is going to be a situation where the EFF is able to step in because it's not a clear-cut case where 
we know exactly what the outcome should be and we just have to get there. In other words, the EFF and the ACLU and even lawful masses, I don't want to step in and defend cases that are very clearly a win for the plaintiff. I would like to make sure that I represent in cases where I can make a true difference and it will further the cause. Now I'm not in a position where I'm representing because of lawful masses yet, but we are going to convert over to something soon and that's why we ask for your financial support because I need to eventually and very shortly here uh, pay for the registration of a corporate entity, the for the writing of a mission statement, mission, bylaws, motto, appointment of board members, and the filing of our nonprofit uh, IRS status. And once that's granted, um, I will convert over to doing lawful masses exclusively. And that will involve representing people occasionally, or at least coordinating the representation of people like we did in the hex chess dice box case from Elderwood Games and versus Chris Taylor. So I'm looking forward to that, but I've got a lot to get through and uh, it's a, it's an exciting time, but like I said, I, it's it can be overwhelming as well, just like we said about uh, people who get sued for copyright and all that. So any, uh, any last thoughts or any last questions before I take it out? No, I'm good, good coverage. All right. Thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. With me in the virtual studio has been Blackleaf, your favorite uh, patent attorney. And you can find which, how do we find your channel? Is it under Uncivil Law? Uncivil Law, which is growing at leaps and bounds right now, which I'm yeah, very I happy about. Yeah, I think I just saw you hit 5,000 subscribers. I'm really, uh, I, I really happy for you. I gained a quarter of my entire subscriber base in the last month. Very nice. I don't know why the YouTube algorithm likes me right now, but I'll take what I can get. Mac the Knife, no, I don't know that I'm incorporating in Pennsylvania, but I'm still researching my options. Um, I don't, and, and, I, and I might hire an attorney to do it for me. Uh, Matthew East, thank you for the $10. Uh, really appreciate that. And let's hide that one. So thank you for joining me. Oh, and thank you for Tactical. Tactical was also here moderating and and asking uh, helpful questions. I really appreciate you being here, Tac, in the virtual studio. So thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Lawful Masses is my baby that I've created to help bring you legal news and education on contemporary topics of law. It is financially supported by our revenue on YouTube and by our supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law. At the $50 level in the month of March, thank you to Wes Delge, Aspernari, Video Remonetize, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, who I see is in the chat, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, who is in the studio, Joe Tyson, Benjamin Hightoff, Steven, Ada, Cute Grills in Your Area, Long Reach Jones, Zachary Cheney, Mullen PC, and Anders Thorenfelt. Thank you to the $5 plus supporters, and thank you for the $5 dollars godless melanesia i appreciate all of your support you the five dollar plus supporters including the fifty dollar supporters will be in the description of the videos that drop i will leave this as a vod on youtube for you to discuss thank you for putting up with me i love you all i'll see you in the videos bye